Well, Ken, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. And I guess it's good evening there. It's uh, in the morning here in California. So uh, good to see everybody. Good to talk to everybody. And um, and what Ken had asked me to do is kind of, I just got done with an Exodus series and he wanted me to relate it to uh, current events. And so we're going to walk through that tonight. Um, I'm currently in the book of Daniel. So um, if you want to uh, check out our website, just go to rockharborchurch.net. And then all of our links are on there. And you can listen to all of our platforms, whether it's YouTube, Rumble, BitChute. I uh, have a lot of podcasts and stuff like that that you can tune into. We do prophecy updates weekly. Um just keep in touch with what's going on prophetically. So anyway, what uh, what we're going to start off to do is I'm going to highlight some things that you probably already know in, throughout the book of Exodus, and then I'm going to relate it to some current events. So the first thing, uh, let me share my screen with you guys, and uh, I will walk through this with you. Hold on. screen. Okay. Okay. Ken, can you see my slide? Is that coming out? Okay. Perfect. Okay. Okay. So what we're going to look at then is lessons from the Exodus for our times. And if I can get this moving. So the first thing we, we need to understand as we're going through Exodus is the first highlighted thing is going to be that Israel is God's chosen nation. And we're going to see that they're in Goshen. They've been there, obviously, uh, because of Joseph. And I want to talk a little bit about Joseph. But the point of Exodus, it's a, it's a typology for even what's going on today. So in your, in your broader understanding of things, the Exodus uh, is a typology for the Antichrist and Israel in the future. It is also a, a typology for our salvation through Messiah. So there's a lot of typologies it points to. But if you think of Egypt as uh, representing the world, if you look at Pharaoh as representing an Antichrist type, and you look at Moses as a type of Messiah, uh, then you understand the significance of Israel in the story, that God is going to deliver Israel from Pharaoh and from the world. And so when you look into the future, that's exactly what God is going to do with Israel in the future. He's going to deliver them, rescue them from the Antichrist at the second coming. And so what, what you really want to see is that, that typology and how to bridge it to current events. And so the unfortunate thing that's going on in Christian theology right now is replacement theology. And in replacement theology, you have uh, this wicked idea that the church has replaced Israel. In America, that's led to a lot of churches disregarding the significance of Israel and the prophetic significance of 1948 of them becoming a nation again. And so the majority of churches here in America totally ignore this prophetically. But uh, as you know, uh, remnant believers understand the plan and purpose of God for Israel and they're, they're ch God's chosen nation, even though they're in unbelief. They're going to come to faith in Messiah during the tribulation. So God's not done with them. So one of the things I want to show you is, is um, just some historical records. And this is where Goshen is. Uh, you can see all the green area. And particularly, this is Avaris. Um, this is the best archaeological uh, findings that we have of, of where Israel had settled in Goshen. Today, the, 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 the top layer would be considered where Ramses' uh, city was built. So the, the underlying uh, efforts uh, that they have done through archaeology is found what they, they call a varus. And this is a, kind of a computer-generated uh, model of what it would have looked like in a varus with the Israelis uh, that had settled there under Joseph all the way up through the days of, of Moses. And there was a palace there, an Egyptian palace there in Avaris. This is what, uh, again, uh, uh, a rendition, what they have found from archaeology. 
um, what it would have looked like in this palace. This is where Moses would have been found uh, by Pharaoh's daughter. And you can see more of the palace here uh, next to Avaris. And it would have looked something similar to this. Uh, where the Israelites were. Again, this is all recreation based on uh, the archaeology of Avaris. And this is very interesting. In um, one of the areas in Avaris, you find a, um, uh, a monument inside a pyramid grave. Let me show you real quick what that looks like. Uh, you, there, here is the courtyard that they found in Avaris. If you'll notice the pyramid grave on the left-hand side, um, that's what they found along with those other, um, let me see if I can point these things out. Do you see my pen and I'm going through these, these areas right here, these things? That is graves. It, and right here's one, right here's one. And this is one, obviously. So when you count all these up, you end up with 12. And so what we see is in this courtyard, in this palace right here, someone buried 12 people. And the, the big one here that's focused in on is this one, which we assume is might be Joseph's grave. And so these are probably the graves of the 12 patriarchs uh, in Joseph's courtyard. Anyway, um, I wanted to highlight that so you can see. So let's go back a little bit. Um, to this. Um, so inside, inside the, that one monument, what they found was a statue of an individual that looks like this. Now, as you can see, this is not an Egyptian haircut. This is um, kind of a, a mushroom-shaped haircut. And in, interesting enough, when they did the archaeology and they looked at the individual, the individual had red hair. And if you remember, King David had uh, red hair or ruddy hair, it, as it's described. And so this individual is Asiatic. He is not Egyptian. And notice the coat that the individual wears. The coat um, has a, is a coat of many colors, and this is what his statue looked like. I also want you to notice the color of the skin of the uh, individual. The color of the skin is painted yellow. So what the Egyptians did uh, when they, they depicted Asiatic types of people, they put yellow skin on them. So this is not an Egyptian. This is a Persian, a Persian, a Persian, a person from uh, the Canaanite region, at, at which they called Asiatic. And so this is different. What we see here, this is a very Semitic person. He has red hair. He has a coat of many colors. And you can see on the archaeology on one slide, you can see the colors there and what they have found. And so here's another slide of... Um, of uh, what we see uh, from the archaeology, and uh, he again, you can see kind of the distinction right there in his arm of what that coat of many colors would have looked like. So, what you're perhaps seeing is what Joseph looked like, and this is his tomb. Now, the interesting thing about archaeology here in the, in the tomb, there was, no, there was no body found. It was just this monument inside the tomb. And you know why there's no body found, no bones, because remember, Moses took the bones of Joseph to bury him in the land of Israel. Anyway, we'll continue on. I wanted to show you this. So here's what they have found in Avaris as far as they think this is Joseph's dwelling place, his palace. The interesting thing uh, about this, and I'll highlight this, if you, if you notice in these areas right here, what they have found is 12 pillars. And there's the number 12 everywhere. And obviously you can see why, because Joseph representing, you know, the 12 tribes of Israel, he represented them in pillars. So this interesting palace 
has 12 pillars everywhere. And this is the same palace that has obviously the, uh, the, the tombs um, that uh, we saw earlier. Let me go on. And there's, there's, you can see there is where the, the, the pillars are, the 12 pillars. And this is what the house would have looked like. This is, you might, uh, you might be looking at Joseph's house in this picture. And here are the tombs again. And here's Joseph's tomb that they found this, this individual in. And here's some more things that we see. This is a kind of a blurry shot, but what we see from, from, uh, uh, archaeology is that there are this these canals that were built and we they believe that these canals were built by joseph uh to uh, avert the famine that was coming to the land remember seven years of plenty and seven years of famine and they believe that joseph built these canals to divert the water and to grow these crops in the seven years of plenty so that it would uh, maintain uh egypt's uh, food supply. And interesting thing is this, this Lake Kuran, uh, you can see this from space. Um, this is the canal system that Joseph might have built to divert the water from the Nile to, to ensure that e Egypt was able to grow its crops during that period of time. So it's very fascinating to see this. Um, anyway, what's the point of that? The point is, the archaeology backs up what the Bible said. There was a people group there, and all of a sudden, they disappear. All of a sudden. And so we see from what the Bible says, it backs up, you know, uh, is backed up by archaeology. Now, we, we get that, we understand that, that increases our faith. Okay, so then we have to peel out the spiritual truths about this. In regards to Israel, God is obviously not done with Israel. And if he can deliver them at that point in time, he's going to deliver them in the future. And so even we see Russia, um, you know, invading Ukraine. But, you know, Russia's not going to stop because uh, if they are Gog and Magog and we believe they are, they're eventually going to attack Israel at some point in time, along with uh, Iran, Turkey, uh, Libya, Sudan, Ethiopia, um, and they're going to attack Israel. But God will deliver them according to Ezekiel, and God will continue to deliver Israel just like he did in Egypt, even to this day. And so one of the things, again, like I mentioned, is you must see Egypt as representing the world system, the satanic world system. And so one of the applications for you and I in these last days is for you and I to recognize that what we're in right now is the world system, and you and I might be in this world, but, but we can't be of it. I see what's happening in the churches. God is shaking the churches right now. And he is trying to shake and wake up people, wake up believers to say, this world system has, has gripped the entire church almost. And you must release yourself from this world system. And so like we see in America, what happened is American churches and pastors went right along with the government and complied with the government in the shutdowns and lockdowns. In California, they weren't even allowed to sing in churches. They were banned. And so many of us rebelled against that, that tyranny, and we, stayed, we kept our doors open. But what happened there is a test for the American churches of whether or not they're going to obey man or obey God and not forsaking the gathering of themselves. And what we saw here in California and what we saw in America was that pastors and churches would not let go of the world system because they kept their doors open because the United States government kept giving them federal funding to stay closed. It was called PPP money. And they could take that money and pay for their staff, pay for their bills, however long they needed to stay shut down. And what it revealed was that these pastors, these churches were embedded in the world system. And now, now that the shutdowns are over, what happened to these churches that took government money and complied? Well, I can tell you what happened. They came out woke. 
the first day they started back, they started back saying, we need to apologize for our white privilege. And they got on the critical race theory. They got on the LGBT agenda. And it's like they all went woke. So in America, we're having a major problem. There's a remnant of churches that truly believe the scriptures and are not part of this world system. But unfortunately, many of the churches in America have succumbed to the world system and they're touting the world system now. And it's going to get worse. More things are coming for the church here in California because we are so stupid as a federal government. We have lost our minds. They want to get off of uh, oil and gas and go to, you know, uh, electric, which is driven. They want by solar and wind, which is totally unreliable and it, it can't do anything. It'll destroy our economy. But here's what they're proposing, that we cannot drive our cars on Sunday, that they're going to stop all automobile transportations on Sunday. Well, that, as you know, is going to kill churches because you, many people have to drive to church. They can't walk to church. And so they targeted Sunday morning. And that's getting ready to happen here in the near future. So the test for the church will be, will people still drive their car to church in order to go to church or, and be penalized by that? Um, or we're, will the churches just comply and say, well, we're not going to have services anymore. We're going to go back to Zoom. We're waiting to see what the churches will do. But unfortunately, it's another test that's coming. And unfortunately, I don't believe a lot of churches will leave that world system. Anyway, I got to move on. The next thing I want you to see in studying Exodus is to see that Pharaoh is an antichrist typology. There's many antichrist typologies in the Bible. Nimrod is a type. Evil Haman is a type. Antiochus Epiphanes the fourth is a type. Uh, and you have all these typologies throughout scripture. So, so Pharaoh is another typology. He points forward that uh, the ultimate antichrist. And what you see in these typologies is they hate Israel. They absolutely hate Israel. And they try to destroy them every time, whether it's Haman or anyone else. They try to destroy Israel, which is exactly what the Antichrist will do at the 12, uh, sorry, at the, um, at the midpoint of the tribulation. He will, he will turn on Israel. He will break his covenant and try to destroy and wipe out Israel. Now, many people ask, why does Satan want to wipe out the Jews? And why has he always wanted to wipe out the Jews? Well, number one, to destroy the line of the Messiah. But then now for our times, it's to destroy the Jews in order to prevent the second coming. Because when you study the second coming, the second coming is predicated on Israel's receptive, uh, receiving the Messiah as their Lord. And, and so his intent is to destroy every living Jew on the planet to prevent the second coming. Because if there's no Jew to call out for a Messiah and say, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, then the second coming can't happen. And so that's how Satan works. He's trying to prevent the second coming because it seals his doom. Anyway, one of the traits that you'll see with Pharaoh when you study Exodus is he puts out propaganda. Uh, propaganda lies and creates a false threat with Israel. And if you recall, he says, these people are getting too large. And the propaganda is that these people are going to take over us. And so we've got to reduce their number. We've got to put them in their place. And so um, otherwise, they're going to team up with some other Asiatic tribes, and they'll overthrow is, uh, uh, Egypt. And so that was what the propaganda was, that we've got to do something about these Jews. Because they're a threat to our society. Now, if you bridge that to today, they're saying the same thing about Israel and the Middle East. And they say the same thing about Christians who believe the Bible. So many of you are part of this remnant church around the globe. You and I are their threat. They see us of standing in the way of their new world order, their new uh, values, their new... Uh, whatever you want to call it, wokeism, Babylonianism, whatever you want to call it, you and I are the threat. We stand against the LGBT movement. We stand against the transgender movement. And because of that, 
we become enemies. And so what they do is make a propaganda about us and about Israel, right? They'll say to Israel, they're an apartheid state and that they're persecuting um, uh, the Palestinians when right now Israel is currently going through a terror of Palestinian terrorists. They've killed about 11 or 12 Jews right now in Israel, and no one's really wanting to talk about it. And this, this terror keeps happening. But eventually, it's going to come to Western society. And this is what you and I have to be prepared for, whether it's in Europe or in America or Canada, Australia, all Western societies are now targeting the Judeo-Christian ethics and morality and they're targeting them as hatred, hate speech, and that we're intolerant. And so one of the things you have to prepare yourselves is they're making up lies about us. They're making up propaganda. So I've been the target of many lies. Because I kept my church open during the pandemic, because we realized the stats coming out were ridiculous. And this thing uh, was survivable about 99.99%. They did not warrant a shutdown. So I got accused of being a murderer because all, I didn't care about people's health. And so I was murdering people and I didn't uh, uh, abide by the scriptures of Romans 13. Well, I took a lot of heat, but it doesn't matter. They, they misinterpreted Romans 13 and they complied with the government. But, they, but anyway, it, it happened and they made all kinds of lies and propaganda and they're going to do it to us as well in these end times. Furthermore, when you see in Exodus that the, the maid servants that they, 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 uh, they, that Pharaoh put out an edict to um, you know eliminate the baby boys and 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 kill them basically and throw them into the Nile, um, this is when the 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 uh, midwives decided to disobey the government, and they had the right to do that, and that's what you and I have to see in the times that we live in is there are going to be times when we have to resist, that we have to say no, that we don't comply with the government, especially if they ask us to violate scripture. Another thing to think about, in the United States, the, um, our, our law of the land is the U.S. Constitution. Now, here's how to understand Romans 13. If a lower jurisdiction like our governor here in California by the name of Gavin Newsom, who is a nothing but a globalist who's been trained by Klaus Schwab. When he gives an edict out and says, you must maybe, uh, let's, let's say he's going to put out the edict of, um, you can't drive your car on Sunday and go to church. Well, I have every right to disobey him because he's not complying with our laws of the land in the U.S. Constitution. And in the U.S. Constitution, we have freedom of religion and the free exercise thereof. So therefore, according to Romans 13, I can obey God and the law of the land and disobey a lower magistrate or a lower, lower jurisdiction when he's not even in compliance with the higher law. And so that's where I think when Ken gave the example of this, this pastor there in England who stood his ground, preached the word, and got arrested, and then obviously got let off, he's obeying the higher law. And the lower, the lower law was, was not in compliance even with the higher law. So, so the one what, that's what we have to keep thinking about. We always obey God over man, but then go to the higher law on the law of the land. And if the higher law allows you then comply with the higher law and disobey the lower jurisdiction. That's how we, we deal with things here in America. And I'm sure there's things like that in England in your law as well, because we have to figure this out. The blanket thing of, of people saying, well, we're just going to obey whatever authority that tells us what to do. No, that's wrong. That's not an accurate idea of Romans 13. Again, look at the jurisdiction. And if the lower jurisdiction tells you to do something that's wrong, don't obey that. Keep doing what you're supposed to do. And that's what the, the midwives did. They wouldn't comply. And in fact, they lied. They lied and said these Hebrew women have babies too fast. We can't get there in time enough to, to kill them. 
And so what you see is the same thing that happened in Nazi Germany. If a Nazi troop went up to a door of a person who was hiding the Jews, they were obligated to lie at that point in time. No, I do not have any Jews that I'm hiding in order to preserve the life. So in cases like this, where you're preserving a life, it calls and demands that you would lie to protect the life, just like it did with uh, the, mid, the midwives, just like it did with hiding the spies of Rahab, she lied. And just like you and I would do if we were in Nazi Germany and they asked us if we were hiding Jews and we were, we would be forced to lie in order to protect the life. So the higher principle of protecting life overshadows the other principle of lying. So you got to understand that. Now, we're not in a life and death situation now, but in life and death situations, your job is to protect the life. So anyway, let's move on. So now we have Moses' mom who's going to protect Moses. And basically what you see with her is her faith is going to confront the opposition. She's not going to allow the government of that world of Egypt to, to kill her baby. And so what she's going to do is have incredible faith to put her baby in this basket, this ark, to protect Moses. And what she's going to do is navigate Moses through the reeds. Now, what you have to understand about this is many movies depict this in the wrong light. What they do is they say, well, she just pushed Moses out in the river and let him go and let him float. That's not, that's not what happened. She put him in this basket and Miriam is going to watch over the basket and make sure that the basket is discovered by Pharaoh's daughter. So this is a plan of action. There is faith involved. There's no doubt about it, but they have a plan so that the, the that baby Moses can be found by um, the daughter of Pharaoh. And so what we have to think about in what we do is we have to operate in faith, but we also have to have a plan of action in what we're going to do. So let me ask you this. What they're getting ready to do is go to a digital currency. That's going to affect everybody on this planet. The United States is already talking about it. Joe Biden has already said he's going to uh, create a digital currency. And because of that, our whole economic system is going to change. I don't know how, what Europe is doing, but I know they're right in line with this as well. And it's just a matter of time. So what you and I have to do is have a plan of action and also have a plan of faith. Because a lot of these questions cannot be answered right now. We don't know all that we need to do. So we're going to have to trust God, but still have a plan of action. Well, you say, well, what's the plan of action? I would first say, number one, prepare that you're going to lose the value of your money if we go digital. America's looking to have a buyback rate on their digital currency by $1. If we want to buy $1 of digital currency, we'll have, uh, we'll have to pay a dollar and a half for that, that dollar. So they're going to make money off of us. So that means that we're going to lose the value of our money. It's going to decrease. We have to be prepared economically for that. Well, what do you mean? I have, to, I have to make sure I'm out of debt. Being out of debt is a good plan. I have to make sure I don't have a bunch of debt that's going to weigh me down because if my money decreases, I won't be able to pay off that debt. So that's a plan of action. Another plan of action is, is to make sure that you have tangible assets. Um, that's another plan. But again, beyond that, we have to trust God. So that's kind of where faith has to confront this opposition and has to have a plan of action, just like uh, Moses' mother did. Now, here's an interesting thing I wanted to point out about the ark. Um, the ark is divine provision. And basically what you see from the ark, it is shelter from wrath. Uh, it's a, it, the ark is a place of refuge and security. The ark, uh, if you look at the ark's materials, it, they came out of the earth, right? The ark contains something very valuable in it, right? Um, it's extremely valuable to God. So there's all these little cues in here that I want you to see. 
Furthermore, when you address the ark, uh, the life in the ark is secured by the sacrifice of, uh, uh, of the living that was cut off. Now, what was cut off? It was the reeds. It was the, the papyrus that they made this little ark of. So something that was living then was cut off. The ark has no human to guide it. It's going to be guided, obviously, by, um, by God, but Miriam's going to watch it. Only God guides, guides where it's going to go. Um, the ark is coated with pitch. Obviously, uh, there's something there about uh, where we get the word Kippur, Yom Kippur. It makes propitiation um, through it, through the sacrifice, and it covers its atonement. It's a ransom. Furthermore, about the ark, there's three arks in Scripture. Uh, Noah's ark protected, uh, from, uh, protected the, uh, the people in the ark from God's wrath. Moses is protected from Pharaoh or Satan or the Antichrist wrath, so to speak. And the Ark of the Covenant is protecting the, uh, uh, the Ark of the Covenant protects from the condemnation of the Mosaic law. So what you see in these three arcs, it is a picture of someone. And I'm sure you can probably guess who that picture is. Every time you see Noah's Ark, Moses' Ark, or the Ark of the Covenant, it's a picture of the Messiah. Messiah is pictured. Messiah was living and then he was cut off, right? The Ark of the Covenant was made of acacia wood. It was alive at one point, then it was cut off to make the Ark. And so this whole picture and dynamic of the Ark is a picture of the Messiah. And here's what we have to understand, the takeaway from this. It's the application of this. No, no matter what we're going through and what we're going to see in these last days, we have to understand that Messiah will guide us and protect us from all of this. And, and we're going to see a lot of crazy things. I mean, we could be raptured tonight, no doubt about it. But if the Lord keeps us here and the rapture is closer to the tribulation, we could see a lot of crazy things. We could see the formation of a digital currency. We could see the shortening of a food supply and supply chains. We could see um, the one world government start forming, which they're talking about that now of creating a new world order. We could see a lot. But no matter what we see and what we have to endure, the Lord will protect us through it. He is our ark. He is our protection. And he will take us through a lot of these things. And so that's a, 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 a good consolation that we have from the Lord through the story of Exodus. Now, let me show you another thing. You guys recall what Moses did when he took matters into his own hands. Um, he saw one of the uh, uh, his brothers, so to speak, of uh, a Jewish brother being beat by the Egyptian, the slave master. And you recall that Moses jumps in there he kills the guy and buries him, and then that, that, that causes him to have to run out of Egypt because now they know he's killed an Egyptian, and he is now a murderer, and he's a criminal, and they, have, they go after him, and so he has to leave the area and get out of Egypt. Okay, so the point of that story is this. It's how not to function in a time of crisis. And that's the thing we have to understand. We're, we're getting into a time of crisis in the church. We're seeing a lot of bad stuff happen in the church. We're seeing a lot of bad stuff happen in the world. And what I talk to a lot of Christians about is they have a lot of anger, a lot of anger of watching the world get as bad as it's getting to watching these lunatic leaders do the stupidest things you could ever possibly imagine, and it has an effect on their lives, and they're getting very angry. And so one of the, the aspects that we have to keep in mind is, yes, the things are, are happening make us all very angry. I feel a lot of times like Lot in Sodom and Gomorrah, and he, it says his spirit was vexed in that area. Uh, seeing all that he saw. And my spirit is vexed, and I'm sure your spirit is vexed. But the thing you can't do 
is you cannot retaliate against this evil. Um, you have to protect yourself, no doubt about it, but you can't take matters in your own hands. You have to leave the justice over to God and let him deal with it. Otherwise, we will do stupid things and take matters in our own hands. Now, here's another thing that's going on in America that I want to bring to light. We have a lot of conservatives in America that if they keep pushing them, these conservatives in America might take matters into their own hands. We are what we call a pre-Civil War mentality going on in America. There's a lot of people that are sick and tired of seeing what they're seeing. And I think it's only going to take a few more things to push these people over the edge to where they start actually physically retaliating against America. And I think we're on the brink of a civil war. Now, uh, as a Christian, I'm watching that. And that's something we should not do is take matters into our own hands and cause a civil war. But I'm seeing it happen with many, many conservatives. And there's a fever pitch about it. I, I don't know what it would do to push these people over. Maybe a digital currency. I don't know. But we're at that point in America. and. Um, Again, if they do that, that plays right into the globalist hands because then they can go into martial law. Just like you saw it happened in Canada and Trudeau decided to go into martial law for the first time and put down the truck drivers, you're going to see things like that from the U.S. government if people decide to retaliate. So it's not going to be good, but Moses's taking things into his own hands is a good reminder we can't do that. The other thing that points out is, is what a crisis reveals. And it, it revealed Moses' heart. He didn't know how to wait on God. He didn't know how to trust God. He went ahead of God. And he will spend the next 40 years in the desert learning how to trust God and not get ahead of God in what he does. And so when we're going through this crisis, like the crisis that we just went through, especially with the shutdowns, the lockdowns, this stupid pandemic that was planned out, um, it revealed a lot of things about people. It revealed who the remnant was. It revealed who the non-remnant was. It revealed the wheat and the tares. It revealed Laodicea. It revealed the lukewarm. It revealed worldly believers. It revealed carnal believers. It revealed a lot of things. And now in the world, it revealed a lot of things. Things that they used to hide are no longer hidden. Now they're coming out and saying, we're going to establish a new world order, a global governmental system. They're not hiding that anymore. So a lot of things have been revealed about people and about what people are doing. And so that's what crises do. They reveal. And so expect more crises to come. And expect more revealing to come. God is doing a work of revealing. He's revealing evil and he's revealing the church. And I am thoroughly disappointed, probably as you are, with the church. The church has been revealed and it's sickening about what has been going on now in the church. We've known it's been there, but now it's on full display. In America, we have lesbian. We have gay pastors. We have transsexual pastors. That is an abomination. We cannot believe that this is happening. We have churches in America that are now uh, having drag queen Bible study story hours for kids. It is absolutely insane. And again, I, we couldn't believe what we're seeing, but it's been revealed and God is revealing this to show us how bad the church really is and where the remnant is. The next thing I want to talk about is how the desert grows us. Now, the lesson here is once God, uh, uh, or sorry, once Moses did what he did, he had to run to Midian to hide out, and there he was for 40 years, uh, tending to Jethro, Jethro's flocks in the desert as a shepherd, 
And what he was doing out in that desert by himself was being grown by God. And sometimes the best place for us to grow is a desert environment, not a literal desert environment, a metaphorical desert environment. Sometimes we have to be alone with God and where we're hemmed in and we have no place to go so where, that he can work on us and grow us. And you might have been in your own desert experience. I have been in my own desert experiences and they're not fun, but they're there to grow us. And you might be in a desert experience right now. And because of that, God is growing you. You may not see it, but think about what he was doing with Moses. For 40 years, he was watching the flocks of Jethro. Because when he would become the leader of Israel, he was to be over the flock of Israel. He was to shepherd them. He was learning to be a shepherd leader. See, before this, Moses, um, he wanted to be a deliverer of Israel, but he wanted to be a rancher. And what I mean by that is the difference between a shepherd and a rancher is a shepherd leads the flock, a rancher drives the herd from behind. So Moses had to learn how to be a shepherd, not a rancher, to lead Israel, not to drive Israel. And so look, Moses learned that. He learned humility. He learned how to follow God's lead. And that's what we need to learn because I can tell you this right now. This time that we're in is a very confusing time. Think about the media, folks. We don't know if they're telling us the truth or not. We know for the most part, the mainstream media is a bunch of liars. They're putting out propaganda and you can't get a straight story. So what we have to rely on is God, God to tell us the truth, his word to tell us the truth and the Holy Spirit to convict us of what's going on in the world. And if you are prophecy students, knowing prophecy helps you discern the signs of the times. It helps you read what's going on. And so we're going to have to rely on God to give us information in order to navigate this world that's so crazy and, and, and we can't get a straight story from them. That's what the desert treat, uh, teaches us, to rely on God, that he will guide us, that he will share the truth with, uh, with us through the Holy Spirit. And that's what we need. So there's a lesson in and of itself there.